Hey everybody, Ryan here, and I want to begin tonight with the words of Len Vintus. In presenting the first issue of The Linking Ring, we wish to say that we will not start off with an apology over the size, appearance, or getup of the magazine. Never before in the annals of any organization has a magazine been started with as few members as the IBM has at the present time. Although only in existence a very short time, the membership of the society is far exceeding our fondest hopes. This is mainly due to the bunch of real fellows who are already in the society who have done so much towards boosting the organization and increasing its membership. This is from the very first issue of the Linking Ring magazine, published... Uh, there's not even a year on here, but it was 1922, I believe, uh, issue uh, number one of the Linking Ring magazine. At the present date, it's being sent to members free of charge, but at a later date, we expect to charge a subscription fee of 50 cents to partly cover the cost of paper, multi-graph ribbon, postage, etc. Extra copies can be had for five cents each. That is the bargain that we are here tonight to talk about. The Linking Ring magazine is the treasure trove upon which IBM members are sitting. And there's an old saying, if you ever wanna hide something, put it in a magazine. The whole point of this show, Inside the Ring, is to shine some light down into this gold mine and see what we can find. So with that, I appreciate they're here tonight as one of those few members joining in at the very beginning. <laughs> Let's roll with Inside the Ring. So tonight we begin our journey, finding out what is inside this magazine I, I, my own experience as a member, uh, when I first started, I would devour every single page of The Linking Ring. My first ever issue that I got, the one that has your name in it as a new member. <laughs> oh my goodness, every single page of that was probably studied and memorized for a time. But maybe your experience is similar. It went on to the point that uh, I didn't necessarily uh, read every issue as much. You know, as, as you go on as a member, you start to let that slip and it's not quite as exciting when they arrive in the mail. You may even let some pile up with the plastic wrap still on them. And that this show is all about encouraging you to open up that plastic wrap and see what's inside. And we do have some folks here tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. we got people from Michigan and Oscar's here. Hey, Oscar, good to see you. We got Christopher, the one of the one of the regulars here on the IBM Jam series. I really appreciate you folks coming in to watch the show here tonight. And this is live interactive. We have live guests in the studio tonight. We also have a couple pre-recorded uh, videos for you here tonight. But please, your comments are not only welcomed but encouraged. It's the only way we can get some sense of applause in these times. So we really appreciate it. People coming in from all over America and maybe all over the world being an international organization. I think we've already outnumbered the IBM. When this first issue was published, there was 20 members of the IBM. So we've already outnumbered that crowd. So I'm throwing stuff around the studio already. So let us, uh, let us roll forward here. Tonight, we're going to learn some tricks. We're going to talk about some tricks. We're going to get into some tips and techniques for how to present better. And at the very end, I have an interesting little discovery for you, which was the first trick 
ever published in the Linking Ring magazine. I, I looked that up and I learned it for you. I learned, kind of learned it for you. <laughs> and I'm going to demonstrate that at the end of the show. But first we have one of the columnists of the Linking Ring coming up here tonight. And he is going to share with you one of his signature routines. And to begin, we have a performance of that routine. So please welcome to the IBM uh, stage inside the ring with us here, Andrew Wu. Welcome IBM members and magicians all over the world. My name is Andrew Wu and welcome to this wonderful day. I've been asked by the IBM to perform a trick for you, uh, something of my favorite type, and I will do that for you today. But before I begin, there's a couple things I would like to share with you. One, if you see some rings in my eyes, it is a selfie ring, a lip ring. And of course, uh, I should also let you know that I usually perform this to the right of my performance surface. So I'd be standing up, uh, the glass would be over here and to my right, and then to my right would be the spectator. Speaking of spectators, unfortunately, due to the current circumstances, we do not have a spectator today. So you'll just have to use your imagination. But I think with that being said, you will get the gist of the effect. So sit back, relax. You don't necessarily have to take any notes. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about it afterwards. All right, here we go. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for volunteering. I can tell right off the bat that you were very interested. From the glint in your eye to the small drool mark on your lips, I can think, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, come on up, come on up. Yes, absolutely. Yes, what's your name? Thank you very much for offering to join us today. Uh, before we begin, I'd like for you to just extend your hand like this, palm up, uh, fingers together, and pointing outwards. Great. Is that your favorite hand? Yes, good. And I will just uh, position your hand accordingly. All right, good. Just keep it there as best as you can. Hold it uh, some, you know, still, right? Okay, good. All right, um, now I should ask, I'm very curious all the time whether or not maybe you've had your palm read before, have you? By a psychic or maybe a fortune teller? No, you have not? Well, guess what? I now have, your palm has been read. Fantastic. You will notice now that the little fish is turning and twisting and making all sort of contortion type moves. But what's really important to note is the final resting position. Okay, can you remember that? Good. I should also share with you, this is no ordinary fish. This is a fortune telling fish. And it will give us a fortune at the end of that and tell us exactly what the next steps are. Cool? Excellent, all right. It looks like it's rested at that particular position. Let's see what it means. On this envelope, there's a bunch of lines, and I'm just going to point to this uh, line right here, and you tell me if this is exactly the correct line. Is it? Good. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to share it with the audience. It does say, the final resting position is a moving tail. The magician performs a cool trick with your $10 bill. Isn't that kind of cool? Yes. Would you like to see a cool trick? Yeah. Do you happen to have a $10 bill handy? You do. Perfect. If I can kindly borrow that $10 bill. Oh, that's excellent. Yes, it is her $10 bill. And I must reassure you at this point in time, you will receive it back. So I don't want you to worry. Okay. Now make sure you keep your hand absolutely still. All right. Now, for this to work, you have to use your imagination. And your imagination will go a long way in having this an amazing effect. But before we do that, I need to ask you one question. Did you happen to name that fish, like uh, Bob or Fred, or maybe it's Mary, or no, you have not. Uh, it's kind of difficult, I do understand. It's really hard to tell at a quick glance whether that's a boy fish or a girl fish. I know it's pretty hard to say. But I'll be honest with you that that little red fish has no relevancy in this effect whatsoever. It was just there for a red herring. Yeah. So you might get some laughs. You might get some groans. Some may choose to throw a tomato, an apple, if you're lucky, an egg. Right. As promised, a magic trick as foretold by the fortune. All right. So I'm going to take your bill and I'm going to make a little bit of a, an origami type shape with it. 
And I'm going to call this little bill a cone. And that kind of looks like a cone, does it not? Yeah, a little paper cone? All right. All you have to do is use your imagination and you too. I'll snap my fingers like this. Now watch a very cool trick. And there we have a fish. A fish, a live fish swimming around. There you go, a fish. Was that kind of cool? And I have here a bill. This is the bill you gave me? Yes. Thank you very much. What? What is that? At this point in time, the spectator will probably something say something to the effect, well, hang on a sec here. What about my bill? At that point in time, I would say, uh, how about a fish? Or I could probably say, would you like a fish instead? Or I could probably say, that fish is worth exactly $10. Or I can say, as a fantastic final prize for helping me out, I will give you this fish. Of course, the spectator will not be laughing at this point, but the audience will at their expense. Uh, it is kind of funny, I hope. Yes, and then, of course, uh, the spectator will say, what about my bill? And then I would reach in and remove the envelope, and I would say, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but does it say anywhere there that I would be returning your $5 bill? Some more laughs ensues. All right. Just kidding, man. You've been a great help. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I will take the little red fish. I'll place it in the envelope. I'll give this to you as a souvenir and as a special bonus for you coming up to help me today. Don't tell anyone. I'm going to give you a brand new crisp $10 bill. Would that be okay? Yeah. Take it. Please don't spend it on all one spot. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a seat. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> what I'm saying was, <laughs> it's Andrew. Hi, hi guys. Hi, how are you out there? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for joining us, and thanks for sharing this routine. This, uh, so we have limited time here tonight, so everyone out there can know this is found in the October 2020 issue of the Linking Ring. You'll find the whole full write up in your column, which is uh, simple that diversions. Is, is that did I get that right? That is correct. All right. So uh, I, I did have a couple questions for you, maybe some things that, that couldn't fit in the Absolutely. write up here tonight. And one question I had was just uh, in that trick. Oh, and I should mention, uh, we do have the applause coming oh, in here too. I can't thank forget you. that. Thank Oscar. You. And, and so. Charles and I agree that that red herring joke is great. <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> so, um, but I was I was very curious about the practicalities of performing with a live fish uh, yeah. in your act, and yeah. how do you do that? How do you manage that? How does it travel? <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you. Before I give you the answer, to that I, I really want to say thank you very much and kudos to you, Ryan, for putting this show together. I, I know there's a lot of work that goes uh, on behind the scenes, and uh, I really want to thank you for inviting me. I am honored to be here. It's my pleasure on the very first episode as the very first guest. Uh, it, it's tremendous. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, it's a great question. Working with live fish is probably slightly more practical than working with uh, any other small live uh, production, such as a rabbit, a hamster, or a dove, uh, for that matter. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that extra care and consideration are needed. As long as you're prepared to commit, then it will work. So, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, we do have some of your fans here. Uh, we mentions. I love your call of Andrew. So that's Thank great. You. Uh, wonderful to hear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is that, uh, that's from Wei. Uh, yeah, we. Thank you, we. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, to answer your second part of that question, how is it transported and carried? Uh, I have some recommendations. One, if okay. you're working with a fish, uh, make sure you feed them before the performance. Uh, you don't want them hangry at you, right? <laughs> that's, that's the other thing. In terms of carrying a, a fish, it's very, very important that you have the right tools. And I have a little bag here that uh, shares with you all of the tools. And I'll just go through a little bit of it. Uh, oh, wow. I have a container, 
that has uh, the fish and obviously the water. Uh, and, and on the lid, there are holes in it, to, obviously, to let it breathe. There is some food to feed it. In this case, I have a beta liquid mix that is added to uh, water to just make sure that it's the right type of water. I have uh, a fishing net, uh, some um, paper towels, and everything is kept inside of a Ziploc bag for a couple of reasons. One, when traveling, you don't want it to spill. And two, when you're coming back home, you don't want it to spill either. And you can wrap everything up in a nice little bag and transportation is, is, is pretty simple. Uh, what I do uh, make sure is that uh, the bag itself sits very flat, whether in my case, or I actually sometimes put it on the floor of the car and make sure that it's absolutely safe so it doesn't you know, bang around and, and cause the fish undue stress. So that's how I transport the fish. It's, it's basically a fish RV is what you've created there. <laughs> it is, it is. And it comes with music and videos uh, for its entertainment. Yes, absolutely. Very, very cozy, very cozy. Yes. Uh, and so you mentioned in the column that this is a, a routine you've been working on for 18 years in your professional repertoire. And so surely in that time, it's grown, it's changed, it's developed. Can you tell me some of the things you've learned uh, through this process of 18 years? Wow. I, I mean, we could do a, an entire episode about this, but I'll just give you the, the highlights, of course. Great. Uh, well, it started off as, as the miracle fish, and you guys are probably familiar with that. You know, the little uh, cellophane red fish that uh, curls in the, in the hand due to the amount of heat that you have. Uh, and it's a nifty little gag, uh, but like most magicians, we sort of transformed it into our card trick, right? Remember, we did this prediction thing where, you know, just how the fish contorted itself would, would, would realize the identity of the selected card by the uh, spectator. And that would be a miracle in itself. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to take it uh, a little bit a step further. And I decided to do something great about it, and which is uh, combine the interactivity of the little curling fish with a real production of a fish. And it's not something that I, I see too often out there. Obviously, uh, many magicians, we produce uh, doves and bunny rabbits and uh, sometimes some hamsters and, and other small pets and whatnot. But fish are particularly interesting and uh, we can get to those differences in a minute if you wish. But uh, over the 18 years, I gotta say the number one thing that I've learned is it establishes a sense of uh, building your confidence. And I'll tell you the reason why. Fish are not the easiest things to work with. They're very delicate and it has to be treated just right. Uh, secondly, uh, it, it's something that requires initially a little bit of gusto, a little bit of confidence, uh, you know, courage. And over a period of time, you get to, to develop that the confidence and, and uh, take it to an extent where it becomes very comfortable with you. And when the trick transforms itself into uh, a performance piece that you feel very comfortable with, uh, it becomes second nature. And now you could really get into the performance aspect of it and make it your own. And then the audience will be able to see how much fun you have with it. You're not worrying about lines. You're not worrying about moves. Uh, you're just uh, concentrating on and sharing the wonderment that's about to happen. And for me, over 18 years, that's what I've learned. Confidence and the ability to craft a really cool uh, performance piece. Yeah, and I, I imagine the uh, appearance of a live fish has made a pretty strong impact on your audiences as well. Absolutely. There, there's a reason these tricks stick around, <laughs> right? Yes, 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 they do. We did have, have a quick question um, from Tom. He's asking about traveling uh, in TSA airport security, but I'm assuming you would travel by car with this kit. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Depending on the time, uh, you don't have to worry about TSA too much because the fish I use can be purchased almost at any uh, you know, fish store or pet store. So provided you have enough time, you could probably go in and not have to worry about that. But yes, uh, most of my gigs are local, right? And so therefore I would have a, I have a fish tank at home uh, with various types of fish. And we could talk about the different types of fish if you choose, uh, we can do that. I'm not sure how we do well, it on time, but yes. Uh, I, I, I know in, in the column, you do mention the specific fish that you recommend for this. So we'll, yes. we'll, we'll point people back to the linking ring 
uh, to get good. this. So. Sounds good. So. Sounds good. So I, I, I'm going to uh, wish you well, Andrew, and thank you so much for, for joining me on the show. I know our time is very tight here, but I want to try and pack in a lot more. When in doubt, go back to the Lincoln Ring. Check out the Simple Diversions column and Andrew's writing. He's been sharing over, you said, like four years, was it? Or, or? Yes. Well, thanks for asking, yeah. Ryan. This is my eighth. <laughs> This is my eighth, eighth year of eighth doing it, year. and uh, thank you for all the fans that have uh, sent me e uh, countless emails telling me of their success stories. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. I look forward to, to meeting all of you one day at, at a convention, or if you want to connect online, now we have this Zoom thing. By all means, if you have questions, please send it to me at andrew at magicalwoo2oz.com, uh, and I look forward to, to seeing you again, Ryan. Thank you again for having me on. Thank you, Andrew. And I've put up Andrew's email address right there below. He welcomes your feedback and comments there. And in fact, if you do want to check out the column, it is in this month's Linking Ring right there. Simple Diversion, A Fortune and the Fish Miracle in the October 2020 issue, page 100. And there's so much packed into the Linking Ring. There's a lot packed into this show. I'm going to move right on to our next live guests here tonight so there is no further ado please rise for the entrance of judge gary brown <laughs> hey ryan thank you so much for having me you're very welcome so uh, judge brown if you've been reading your lincoln ring you know he contributed the one magician hocus pocus parade in the october 2020 edition he's shared a whole lot of tricks and we we will not be able to talk about them all here tonight but we have picked out a few to kind of dig into and see what we have. So, uh, Gary, I'm going to let you start us off here. Sure. I'm going to say that, you know, first of all, again, thank you for having me. I think this is an exciting idea to sort of uh, get people interested in the magazine. Lynn Miner contacted me a couple of months ago and asked me, he's a good friend of mine, he asked me to start working on a parade. And we started talking about doing Zoom type magic, in other words, virtual magic. How do you perform magic in this space, right? And it's hard because. There are angles, there are issues that we don't have the personal touch. Um, you know, Andrew just had to make up a, a you know, an imaginary spectator, right? It's hard. <laughs> so how do you make, how do you cross this divide? And also you don't have the table, you don't have the angles. It's, it's just tough. So um, in trying to find uh, effects that would work in this circumstance, I dug back into magic history, which I, I'm a big fan. And I found a trick that's about a century old. A lot of people know it in a slightly different form, but Brian, I'd like to do it with you if that's okay. Yeah, um, absolutely. And we called it the Zoom Princess for reasons that don't make sense in a moment. Um, but uh, I brought with me uh, I have five playing cards here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show them, Brian, I'm going to ask you to focus on just one. All right, I'm going to show you the cards. I want you to focus on one of them. Uh, I think you can see the five. You got it? Okay. You got one? Yes. Now, believe it or not, I don't want you to say it because through cyberspace, I'm going to try to read your mind. I want you to put the card in your mind's eye. Put it right there so I can peer into your eyes and see it. No, no. You know, Brian, you're an interesting character. We don't know each other that well. But I'm going to take a stab here. Not only that, I'm hoping everyone else picked the card too. I should have said that earlier, but that's all right. I'm sure they did. <laughs> I'm going to take one out. And if I've done this correctly, your card should be gone. Is your card gone, Brian? It is absolutely gone, yeah. And here's the thing. Mostly everyone who picked a card, I think their card is gone too. Um, and that's crazy because you didn't all pick the same card, right? And I'm not a hypnotist. I couldn't do that. But I would suggest that the card that I removed is somehow emblematic of everyone's card. And that's why it's a wild card. <laughs> Right, so that's the Zoom Princess. <laughs> Based, of course, on the Princess card trick, which is a century-old trick. Um, I'm going to say doing it this way is actually stronger, uh, easier in some ways. I, the ending is a little bit of a twist. I'm not going to give the whole thing up. I guess if someone ran the video back a couple times, they might be able to figure it out. But <laughs> in the column, we talk about this. It's a, it's a great way to deal with a large audience. I did this for 130 people. And I said, okay, everyone pick a card. And I think most of you, you know, your card's gone. And everyone's card was gone. It was impressive. Um, another little trick, I'm, uh, a little uh, tip, I mentioned this in the, um, in the column. I use this uh, black and silver, uh, I, I, it's a blue and silver deck from Bicycle. Um, what's interesting about that is the red cards are not red, they're gray. And right. what's 
thing is talking to muggles afterwards, they all thought that was the way the trick worked. They said, well, the colors are different. You must have thrown me off, which is great, right? Complete accident. It was the only deck I had handy when I did it that time, but now I use it for this trick all the time. So, uh, so that's one thing. And we I have a number of things in, in the uh, parade, which has a good half dozen or more tricks. Um, but I am interested in wands and like new book wand crap, which I will get to. We will talk about it for sure, yeah. <laughs> Lynn said to me, could you put a wand effect in, into the, into the uh, Lincoln Ring? I said, sure. So I came up with something. Um, Ryan, do you have that video by chance uh, teed up? Uh, yeah, you bet. Yeah. So this is called the Prelude Wand. Um, I have it here, but why don't you show the video and we can talk a little bit about it. Right? Okay, let's, let's go to the clip. <laughs> let's go to the clip. Cut to the video. Hi, I'm Judge Gary Brown. I'm here to show you the Prelude Wand. I made this one with a nice giving you a nice Las Vegas feel. But like with any wand, you can show that your hands are aptly empty, that your, your sleeves are rolled up, that there's nothing. But if you take one of those empty hands and make a fist, give it a little tap, it's the Prelude Wand, and all of a sudden, speaking of Las Vegas, it's Las Vegas money. Now, in Las Vegas, that kind of chip might be worth $100 or $1,000 or $10,000 or whatever. But the other thing we say about Las Vegas, in Las Vegas, easy come. That's the prelude one. It's a prelude to something big. And speaking about easy, it's easy to make, it's easy to use, and it's just full of magic. All right, so it's like magic, music. Um, and it's based on a very old principle. So Alexander Herman, the 19th century magician, uh, used to use this, which is a chair wand, right? So it's a spindle for a spindle back chair. And I literally made one of these for a friend who does echo um, magic. He's the re sorcerer, right, Cyril May. Um, and I noticed something interesting about the, about the spindle, which is much thicker on the bottom end than it is on the top end. Right? So it's got, it's about three quarters of an inch here, it's a three eighths of an inch here. And then I realized I could do something with that. And, um, you know, I'm not going to talk about everything here because people should go read the magazine, we give you step by step instructions, but I just want to show you how good this is at concealing something, which is this, right? So here's the coin, it's fixed there. Um, I used to chip in the, uh, in the video. Um, but if you did that on the thin end, it would obviously stand out very much, whereas on the bottom end, it actually hides it to the point where I can hold the wand like this, I can throw the wand hand to hand, you will never see that there's something there. Um, it's a great way to learn, it's, it, it's a great, for somebody who hasn't used a wand in the past, a great way to learn some basic moves, some basic handling, um, that routine gives you some, some tips, and then once you learn that, you learn how to, how to deal with uh, other, other wands. So, Gary, I, I just wanted to clarify this, because I when we talked earlier this week, uh, this was my question for you about the, the tapered wand and the impact that that has. So can you elaborate just a little bit on uh, yeah. the, that if, design? If you look at it, right, so it, it really is, it, again, first of all, it's nice that you can find these inexpensively because people are throwing out chairs all the time, but please don't pull stuff out of your own kitchen chair. I'm not going to be responsible for divorces and so forth. But it's, it's thin on this end, and this one is not as tapered as some. It's three-eighths of an inch here, and it's almost an inch down here. So what that does is it makes it look like a thin wand when actually the, the base is quite thick, and the base helps you hide a load, right? And so from almost any angle, the load is completely concealed because of, this, of the taper. And the thicker it is on the bottom, the bigger the coin is that you have here. I, I actually have a coin. This is a Bermudian or a Bahamian dime. It extends over the edge a little bit, which just helps you when you want to load it. You can pull it out and you can, you can produce it. Um, but that's the, that's the benefit of the tapered wand. And again, I discovered it by accident just because I was playing around with this, this concept. Yeah, I find that fascinating, the optical illusion. Because you know, if you had just a thin wand, then you'd have this giant coin on the end that's harder to hide. Exactly. Or if you had just a thick wand that would hide the coin, it would look like a broomstick. <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't have a, a, a table on it, but you could actually leave this sitting on a table. No one would ever see the coin there, right? Because mm -hmm. it's just, I mean, it just papers out and covers it. So that's what I came up with. And that's my gift to the readers of Lincoln Ring, because if they read the magazine, they'll learn how to build one of those. 
All right. Yeah, the details are in the in the in the print. <laughs> That's and honestly, that's exactly what this show is about. Because there's certain things that are great for print, and certain things that are good for video, and it's, the two aren't always the same. Yeah. So this is this is to supplement the magazine. Yeah. Uh, to your point, years ago, I had, there was a Lincoln Ring piece that I think I think it was Lincoln Ring that Matt Maven wrote, and I contacted him, say, "Oh, I'm going to use this thing. That's really great. This unbelievable mind reading thing you put in there." He's like, "I'm so glad to hear from someone who will actually use one of my tricks." I publish these things, and they go out there, you know. Um, and Max, of course, said that was great, great his intonations, you know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know another, another item in your parade this month was was the uh, the my phone. Oh, let you have one. Yes. Okay. And uh, <laughs> I, in the it has instructions to contact your friend Lynn to get the printable download, which I did, and I couldn't help but wonder that exact thing. I wonder how many people are actually. Gonna go to the trouble of emailing and. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the answer in part because I did. Uh, I first I, I've done this before, and you know it's interesting how many people reach out. You know, but since Lynn has actually got it, he can count. And I'll tell you, so far the number's not big. The number's very small. It's still in single digits. That is a free effect that you can print out. It's a great. I invented that for hospital use, right? Because that was pre-COVID when you wanted to give somebody something and pretty, you know, or you didn't want to go from patient to patient. Uh, it's, you can make it on a piece of paper. It's a brilliant effect. It's a lot of fun. There's a video online that you can check out in the uh, but it, uh, um, in the magazine. Uh, but it's a great, it's a great powerful effect. And everyone should print that and use it and give them away. That's why we, we do this work, right? Um, so you know, stop. So we're 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 just proving that adage that if you want to hide something, put it in a magazine. <laughs> the numbers don't lie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lynn told me this morning he's still on single digits. So you know, but people should yeah. get in touch with him. He's happy to mail it out. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, and uh, so I, I have a half dozen effects in there. I think they're all really strong. I'm very, very proud, very pleased with the work. Tony Dunn did beautiful, beautiful illustrations. I mean, just unbelievable. Um, there's a drawing of me that makes me look more like Miracle Max than, you know, say a fancy, handsome movie. I don't put that other than that. It's great. You know? <laughs> And I'll, I'll pop up the reference for everyone here following along. Uh, Judge Gary Brown, One Magician Parade in the October 2020 issue of The Linking Ring, page 79. And I need it. Definitely. I need it. And it's all, it's all like you mentioned, Zoom oriented magic, uh, stuff that is applicable to the times we are currently living in. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, so I did promise you a surprise, though, Ryan. And yes, yes, uh, I'm ready. <laughs> so um, uh, my, I was very pleased to have my, my book come out this month. I don't know if you can see it or not, Minecraft. Um, uh, Larry Haas published it, uh, and I'm just so, so pleased. This actually came from an IBM thing. I was presenting at IBM in 2018, and I was having some trouble um, concealing a remote. And I just couldn't conceal it. I couldn't get it down. And then I added a wand, and it made it vanish. It's just the greatest, and I was so impressed with that that I really took a deep dive into wand theory, how to use it, how to make it. And Larry came out with the book. He worked with me. It's just beautiful. I mean, it's a great piece of work from Larry's end, and I, I think the writing is quite good, and there's some, a lot of useful things because we've kind of lost touch with the, the wand, um, and it's a useful thing. You know, it will help any magician with almost any type of show. Uh, but I have a little effect in there that I'd like to do with you, Ryan. Can I have you on screen with me? You, you bet. I'm ready. Oh. All right. So I brought with me tonight one of my smallest wands. I know it's not impressive looking, but it's extremely powerful, Ryan. It's extremely powerful. Now, <laughs> uh, just because I want to make sure we cover this, we didn't we didn't plan this. We, you don't know what's going to happen. Right? I have no idea what's about to happen. <laughs> so, Ryan, I need you to use your imagination because this wand is powerful enough to reach across cyberspace to you. Watch. Imagine you have an invisible, invisible deck of cards in your hands. Hold up your hands and show us that invisible deck. Quickly separate them into black cards and two red cards and hold them in your hands separately there. Got it? I'm going to point the wand at one pile, Ryan. You pick the pile. Red or black? Red or black, Ryan? What is it? It's red. I'll point at the red. I do this. An energy wave comes off the end of the wand, goes through cyberspace, hits the red cards, which leap up in the air and do a triple somersault and float gently back into your hands because they're ready to perform while the black cards fade away into nothingness because you didn't pay for them. It's all right. So now quickly separate the reds into um, uh, picture cards and number cards, please. 
So you got the queens, kings, jacks, and the numbers. Got it? Got it. I'm going to point the wand again. Ryan, your choice. Completely free choice. Ryan, what are you going to pick? Numbers or pictures? Uh, the pictures. The picture cards. I hit the picture cards. A sound wave comes off the end of the wand. The picture cards leap to life and begin to dance. And they snap their fingers and the number cards turn into music. Da 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 da. They dissolve. Da 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 da. Da da. And while the picture cards dance around, land back in your hand. Now you've got the picture cards separate the men from the women, the queens and the jacks and the kings. You're just jacks and kings one pile, queens the other. Men or women, Ryan, make your call. call. Uh, the ladies. The ladies. Oh, I have a feeling you picked the ladies. I do this. Another wave of power, a bio wave, goes across. Lost the internet hits those queens. They come to life. One of them waves a scepter and they banish the kings and the jacks from the scene. Now you have two red queens left. That's, of course, the queen of hearts, the queen of diamonds holding in each hand. Name one you choose. Diamonds. Queen of diamonds. I do this. An electrostatic shock blasts through the internet and shocks the queen of diamonds who says, we are not amused. And she storms off into the night. <laughs> leaving you only with the Queen of Hearts. Now, through a series of decisions, you have to I want you to roll it into a tube. Could you do that? Roll it into a tube and reach in your pocket. Imagine you have two white caps like these and you put them on the ends. So now you're holding a wand and, oh wait, I'm holding a wand. Now the core of your wand is made of something. What is it made of, Ryan? Uh, like a unicorn hair or something. Oh, you, no, my wand is a, a queen of uh, hearts. Yeah, a card that rolled up the Queen of Hearts. Now. I've held this wand in the camera frame the entire time. I will take off the caps. And I have here the core. Of my... Now, if this were the Queen of Hearts, that would be something. Wouldn't you agree, Ryan? That would be something. I think your viewers would lose their minds. And in fact, they will. And I'll say to the magicians, please note that it's a Queen of Hearts <laughs> on both ends, if you know what I mean. And it's only one-sided. That's an effect called Wandrous. I came up with it while I was working on the book. It's such a, it's a carry every day effect. It's such a strong effect. Um, it is a lot of fun. <laughs> and I, I get a souvenir. You can keep that. That's for you. Um, uh, you sometimes have to make allocation to have multiple endings only because I've so often done this with people say, you got to show this to my brother or my cousin and you got to quickly do something. But it's so much fun. I came up with it originally. Larry Haas fixed it. He came up with other twists on it. It's all in the book. It's great. It's worth the price of admission just for that. Plus, there's a lot of other good stuff in there. So I just wanted to share that. So speaking of the book, uh, yes, brand new book. We, we definitely want to make sure people are aware of this one craft. If, if you're going to get it, uh, you can get it right from the publisher, theoryandartofmagic.com. That's yes. uh, Larry Hass publishing all sorts of good stuff there. Check out the rest of the website. While you're there, you'll find some excellent magic books. Yes. And... Yep. Uh, business, I but believe. you I mentioned it. It's a for magic books. It is a bargain price. So <laughs> it's, it's three bucks plus plus postage. So you know. and wonderful. Larry, he just wants he wants to get the work out, which is really really nice. So anyway, um, so yeah, huh. that's going on. It's been a big month for me. You know, book and yeah, book. busy, busy. Yeah, in an otherwise well, dismal year, this has been a terrific. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for sharing your busy month here with us. And again, check out Gary's Parade in the October Lincoln Ring. Check out the Wandcraft book, theoryandartofmagic.com. Any any final thoughts for us, Gary? Uh, yeah, go out and do some magic. Go get your magazine out and do some stuff, right? Because we, we need magic now more than ever. We need it more than ever. So please go uh, entertain your friends and your loved ones So uh, and your customers. And Ryan, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So happy you could be here with us. Okay. <laughs> and thank you very much, everyone, for hanging out. We have more coming up from the linking ring. Oh, and I, I forgot to even mention the, the comments here. I get distracted by so much going on. Dan, it's already got the one craft book. Wonderful. And Rob, l uh, love it. Yeah, me too. That's a lot of fun. I love effects like that. That little wand that you can really play with and have fun with your spectators, your audience. So awesome. And that's, uh, I'm pretty sure the, the, the roll up wand is not in the linking ring. It is in the wand craft book, just to be clear. <laughs> so moving on to our next columnist, we have joining us here virtually, a uh, one step removed virtually. 
Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce another Linky Ring columnist from the column, Magic Words Matter, Dr. Lynn Miner. It's my pleasure now to introduce our next guest here on Inside the Ring. And you may know him from his columns, Magic Words Matter, which have been running in the Linking Ring about four years now. And it talks about scripting and the words that we use to tell our stories and communicate our magic. And he is a doctor of speech pathology and a career helping people with um, speaking uh, challenges. And this is exactly what he's here today to talk to us about. So please welcome Dr. Lynn Miner. Welcome, Lynn. Oh, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and share what I know about my field in speech pathology because there are some things there that apply directly to what we do as magicians these days. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I always say, you know, the, the, the story of your trick is more important than the trick itself and that's how we communicate. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. So you said you, you were going to share with us two kind of common mistakes that magicians are making when it comes to their presentations and their patter and the, sure. the solutions to go with those. <laughs> be, be happy to do that. As I look at uh, the things that magicians do and watch their pro programs and presentations and what have you, I see two common issues con continually repeating and reoccurring. Number one, magicians talk too fast. Number two, they mumble and not always clear in their speaking. Well, I wanna drill down on both of those points for you. First of all, in terms of rate of speech, too many magicians talk too fast because they're in a hurry to get into their presentation. They're thinking about the mechanics and the moves that they do, but they're not really paying all that much attention to the rate of speech. How fast do we talk? Well, normal speaking rate for most people is somewhere between 140 and 160 words. However, in this Zoom environment, and this is something that I haven't put in the Lake Newry article because we didn't have to deal with Zoom issues at the time I wrote that, is that because Zoom forces us to slow down and, and, and focus more intently, we need to pull back our speech. And so when I'm pre presenting over Zoom, my speaking rate is about 120 words a minute as opposed to 140 or 150 words a minute. That gives people more time to get acclimated to the message that I'm transmitting. Now, don't take my word for this. Uh, recently, I was in a meeting that involved Max Maven and somebody asked Max, what's the one thing that magicians can do to improve their presentations? And without missing a beat, Max said in his characteristic manner, slow down. So I think that's something that we ought to be, be uh, much aware of. So how do you slow down? Well, the solution is really pretty simple. Put more pauses into your presentations. Experienced speakers use longer and more frequent pause than untrained speakers. Uh, let me give you a couple quick examples. Uh, it was the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. You see, the pauses are in there. Or if you want it in, in a uh, grant uh, ma magic trick, uh, I think about something like this. One card Pete was a gambling man. They knew him very well in Reno. He cheat in every kind of game from tiddlywinks to Kino. You see, those are a couple of examples about inserting some pauses will help heighten the drama of the presentation and the pauses cause the readers and listeners to uh, pay more attention and kind of perk their ears up, if you will. So pause is a solution to slowing down and not talking so fast. Let me jump to my other suggestion for you, 
and that is mumbled speech or what we call in the field of speech pathology, the lack of good, clear articulation. People mumble because they're not paying much attention to how they speak. They don't open up their jaw. They don't get their words out. They, can, they tend to stay constrained within your lips. You need to do what uh, speech pathologists call engage in some over articulation before going on into a public presentation. So here's what I do. It works for me and hopefully it'll work for you too. I do several speaking situations before I go on stage or go into a Zoom lecture or what have you. Uh, they can be several things. One of them is, is tongue twisters. Uh, I can say things like, oh, uh, are, you, are our oars oak? I get all tangled up and try to say it myself. Are our oars oak? That gets the vowels opened up. Or you can say, uh, uh, sometimes people will kind of do an Elmer Fudd speech and the letter R, the sound R becomes a dub. So you can say, around the rough and rugged rock, the ragged rascal ran. And I do it over-exaggerated. I'm not going to talk like that when I'm performing, but I'm giving my articulators, my tongue and my teeth and my lips, all, all kind of like a warm-up exercise. Or uh, letter S is another one. Sometimes the S gets kind of slurry or slushy. And so I saw a seesaw in the grass. I saw a seesaw in the grass. Or my final suggestion, and this is something I published, I like to use the rainbow passage. Uh, I'll give you a snippet of it, and then I'll tell you why it's important. The rainbow passage goes like this. I do it twice. Once over exaggerated, and the second time just at normal speaking uh, rate. First, over exaggerated. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. A rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. Okay, and so the rainbow passage goes on. And then I back at it a second time in a normal speaking rate. But why is the rainbow passage important? Well, it's not particularly an exciting one. It is specifically written to contain all of the sounds in the English language. Well, there are 26 letters. There are 44 sounds. And by the time I read the complete rainbow passage paragraph, which I've published totally in one of my linking ring columns is coming up around now. It gives me a good chance to go through all of the sounds in the language and get my articulators fully warmed up. So there we have it by way of summary, slow down to a normal slower speaking rate, 120, 130 words a minute. Not all the time you engage in vocal variety, but, uh, you want to hit that as an average, use your pauses. And in terms of articulation, over articulate by using a couple of these warmer exercises that I've suggested to you. And I think those two tips hopefully will help you as you present your patter in an interesting way to your audiences. Okay. Oh, thanks very much, Lynn. I have a couple questions if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, just came up. So one thing I think is a big challenge amongst magicians and thinking about how they're seen by others is being able to recognize when you might have these challenges. How would you recognize that you're talking too fast when it's often the case of nerves and you don't even think about it? Is there a way to kind of clue into that? Sure. There are, there are, I'll give you two answers to that, Ryan. Right? Number one, uh, I hope that most people are videoing their presentations as, as they're practicing. So you can just go back and listen to it and 
and get an intuitive sense. Get an independent speaker. <laughs> My wife is really good at criticizing when I tell me when I'm slowing down. So a significant other can be helpful in a way. But uh, if you want to go at it objectively, in one of my columns that I've written, uh, I tell you how many words there are in that column, and I ask you to read it, and then you time it that way. I'll give you another example. Uh, this coming weekend, I'm giving a 10-minute speech at the uh, Jeff McBride Magic and Meaning Conference. Okay, I've got 10 minutes and I wanna control my rate. So I deliberately wrote my speech. So it's got 1200 words. So dwell, take 1200 words divided by 10 minutes. And you can see, I've got my average exactly where I want it at 120 words a minute. So I think it'll be just right for, for my upcoming presentation. That's great. And I know uh, in, in the October 2020 issue of the Linking Ring, your column does include that rainbow passage. If anyone wanted to dig into that and, and use that to practice, they can find it in that issue, uh, as well as a couple breathing exercises and ideas about you know, how to project your voice better from, from Lynn's column, Magic Words Matter. Any final thoughts, Lynn? No, I think uh, uh, this is something uh, that we don't always pay attention to, but yeah, hopefully bringing it up to the level of recognition and putting on the top of the mind will help uh, result in a more enjoyable experience for you as a performer and for your audience as well. So thanks very much for the opportunity to be with you today to talk about these things. Well, thanks very much, Lynn. Sure. That was Lynn Miner. Uh, I see there was one question coming in from Charles about uh, modulating the pitch. And unfortunately, Lynn isn't live here today with us. That was recorded a couple days ago. But anytime, in my experience, if you have a question for one of the people writing in the Lincoln Ring, pretty much every column includes an email address at the bottom of it. And I think they love it when you reach out and ask them questions. So do not hesitate to reach out and ask for clarification on things here. This is a great chance to, to interact and, and chat with some of our writers of the Lincoln Ring. But it is by no means the only time or only place. Now, my favorite thing, and honestly, my selfish thing, the reason that I created this show was because of how much I love digging into the archives of the Linking Ring. And I'm gonna show, uh, there's, there's, there's actually two different archives for the Linking Ring. This may be confusing to some if you're not familiar with it. There is the PDF edition of the Linking Ring, which has been published since 2005 and that is easily accessible to members. I'm gonna show you that one tonight. There's also a second archive, and that's where I found, for example, the first ever issue of The Linking Ring that goes all the way back and encompasses everything. Uh, so tonight I'm gonna to show you right now exactly how to access, uh, as an IBM member at least, all of the I, uh, Linking Ring issues going back to 2005. And it looks a little something like this. This is, magician.org, the IBM website. And up in the top menu, there is the linking ring and you can linking ring login. Now you do have to be an active member of the IBM in order to do this. You would put in your IBM number here and the password that you have uh, received upon reg registration, uh, which should be in my password manager here. I don't remember what it is. <laughs> and I'm not gonna tell you what it is either. But once you're logged in, uh, that's about all it takes. You have all this member content, including all of the live jams that Alex and I have been doing over the past few months. This is actually Alexander's first Tuesday night off since March, because every week he's been involved in creating these live shows. Uh, and they are also in here under resources, IBM Jam right there, uh, once you're logged in. But we're not talking about that tonight. We're talking about the linking ring. And over here on the side, view current issues of the linking ring, it's the top menu. And look at this, 2020, 2019, all the way back to 2005. So right here, this is the October 2020 PDF edition of the magazine. You can download and read that at your convenience. And you can go all the way back. You can flip through the years 
and download every single edition. Find your friend. I was going through and I found, oh, uh, where was it? 2007, I think. Hmm. 2008. I was, I was surprised. Oh yeah, here. Steve Harbour, my friend Steve Harbour was on the cover of the Linking Ring magazine. And I had no idea. But whoops. No, oh, hang on. I'm not signed into that. What I what did I even click on? Some demonstration, Ryan. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Locked out. <laughs> uh, just to let you know, this is of course a live demonstration. <laughs> I have no idea uh, what just happened here. Oh, it opened a new tab, but my screen didn't show that. My mistake. Okay. Back to business. Okay. Uh, <laughs> where was I? <laughs> Back to uh, this issue. So you can view digital. You can uh, view PDF in browser is what I wanted to click on, not the digital edition. And that'll just open up the PDF file right there for your viewing pleasure as it loads. And there is my friend, Steve Harbour. Uh, I've known him since I was very young in Calgary. He was actually a principal. Uh, when my dad was a teacher, he was the principal of that same school. And so my dad knew Steve before I did, but that is neither here nor there. The important thing is that is exactly how you can access all the back issues uh, from 2005 onward. And there is hundreds of tricks, hundreds of routines, hundreds of articles with all sorts of magical wisdom available at the drop of a hat. But tonight, I promised you uh, something that goes way back further than that. And I'll get into exactly where to find those older issues in the next episode of Inside the Ring. But for now, I want to show you the first ever trick that was published in the Linking Ring magazine. It was not in volume one. It was actually in uh, volume three, the third edition, which was 1923. And it was uh, the new torn and restored dollar bill by Ivanhoe Trudell, who was one of the first 20 members. The new torn and restored dollar bill had an idea in there that I had never seen before using an Aikido box. I'd never seen it applied in this way. I thought it was quite interesting. So I created today a little demonstration of this trick. Of course, I've changed it already quite a bit because that's just the way that I do magic. I just change it. <laughs> so the roots of this trick are from there, but I'm going to demonstrate it here for you now. This is a time capsule. It's a little brass box. Whatever you put in there, you could bury in the backyard and it's gonna last a long time. So what do you put in something like this? Well, I found this old photo and reminds me of the time my grandfather bought a picture frame and these strangers were in it. And he looked at me and he said, how come you were never that cute? That's the thing about memories. <laughs> Not all of them need to be treasured. In fact, I think it's important for each of us to choose what stays and what goes. And that is where a little box like this is just about perfect because there's not a lot of room. When we take a memory better be important <laughs> in order to get in that box. Because once the lid goes on, well, that is now sealed part of you. And it weighs you down a little bit. Every little one does. So you need to figure out what to keep and what to let go. Well, it's those memories that you do keep and become a part of you. And in fact, it's those ones that well, every single one becomes a piece of you. And those pieces join together to make you whole. So 
So that was that that, that was probably <laughs> Oh, thank you, Gary. That thank you, Gary. Appreciate that. That was probably like take 12 of that trick. I've learned a couple things today working on that one. First of all, I'm pretty sure at the time uh, Okito boxes in 1923 were pretty much made for silver dollars. And mine is a half dollar size. And it's difficult to fold up a piece of paper small enough to fit inside a half dollar size Okito box. So if you wanna go back and learn this routine, uh, recommended dollar sized Okito box. I, um, if you go back, like it's it's a one page write up as, as old write ups tend to be very brief and leaving a lot of details to, to the imagination. But I wanted to share uh, the, the final move and here's my scraps of paper here. So in, in the write up, it is just a torn restored dollar. And I added the whole story to it of, of memories because the way I think about it, I think, okay, what do the props remind me of? And why would you put a piece of paper inside of this? And I thought, well, that's obviously some sort of uh, keepsake memento. Uh, it's like a, like an urn for a piece of paper almost. So it must be special. And so I created this, I had this idea to connect that story of a time capsule and memories and all that uh, sort of thing in there. Um, but, the interesting move that I found, if I just use a scrap of paper here to demonstrate, it's essentially using the Okito box as a switching device. And I'd never seen anything like that before. And so uh, for a torn or restore, as I worked on it, as I thought about it, for a torn or restore effect, it seems like a lot of overkill to switch a little piece of paper this size. Why would you even need apparatus like that? But Interesting idea, nonetheless, academically speaking. So you have your, your uh, uh, billet uh, that's coming in, this, the restored billet that's hiding in your hand. Your Aikido box is in the uh, unsuspecting Aikido position to the point you can set that on your box over top of that billet. And here's the move as described in, in the Lincoln Grain. You push that forward to the point that you're holding it like this. So you're holding it between your thumb and second finger, and your first finger is just naturally resting underneath the box. Of course, we know it's not, not just resting, it's working. <laughs> and so it talked about being able to take the lid off in order to show uh, that billet inside, and somehow the third finger getting involved to push up on the bottom of the box and make that whole thing. And I couldn't, for the life of me, figure, figure that out, uh, how this third finger is supposed to be able to push and flip. Like, it, ju it just doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> but I found out, just in practice and trying it, a little adaptation. If you want to go back to 1923 uh, and learn this trick, as you pull off the lid, uh, you're presenting the box as you do. So you're naturally gonna move this hand forward. And as you do, to move it past these fingers as you pull the lid off, you just use those fingers to do the move. So you're gonna present the box and it's flipped in that process. I found that so much easier. So if you go back and learn that trick, that is my quick tip <laughs> on this weird obscure idea of using an Aikido box to switch something. And that was, uh, by adaptation, my repaint job on, a, on the very first trick ever published in the Linking Ring magazine in 1923. And that concludes the first ever episode of Inside the Ring. I appreciate everyone here who's joined us as the audience. I appreciate Gary and Andrew joining me on stage and Lynn helping me out with an interview. And... Uh, as Gary said, the story makes it. And that's exactly what I was talking with Lynn about. The story of your trick is so much more important than the trick itself. So I do have some closing credits, including one little bit of business that is somewhat important here. And that is this. 
The views and thoughts and opinions expressed in this program are of me and the individuals. And this show is not monitored or, or uh, over, overseen by the IBM or the publishers of Linking Ring Magazine. Uh, and that is an important thing. I don't want you to write in to Sammy Smith, although he, he has given me his blessing to, to do this show. Uh, it is not uh, something that he's involved with or, or editing. So I just wanted to be clear on that. It is me and the gang here sharing some magic. If you do have any questions, comments, complaints, I'm the guy. Talk to me, uh, Ryan at wowryan.com. Get in touch. And on that note, if you want to do exactly what I just did and dig into old issues of the Linking Ring and find tricks and make a little performance video, I'd absolutely love to have the members of the IBM be a guest on this show. Send me your video clips or post them on YouTube where I can find them. And I'd, I'd love to have performances from all over the world, from all over the ages, be a part of Inside the Ring here today. We got another episode that's going to be coming up next month. I have no idea what's in it because I haven't read the magazine yet. But stay tuned for that. And you can check out the website currently under construction at insidethering.show. We're all the way, all the episodes are going to be available. I'm going to have show notes detailing anything we might have missed. Thank you very much for tuning in, watching, and good night. <laughs>